This is uh, Holy Spirit One, lesson number four. As we continue our study here on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to start by turning to uh, John chapter 14. And as you're turning there, I want you to recognize that uh, as we begin with verse one of, of chapter 14, that's not where we're going to read, but starting at verse 1 and through uh, chapter 17 of John is some of the most uh, intimate and informative uh, teaching that Jesus did. And these were the last uh, few days, weeks, what have you, uh, before Jesus was going to leave. And so he really brought his disciples together and begin to give them this information and teaching that they would need uh, to carry on after he left. And so it's, uh, these are some of the most important teachings that Jesus did for the church. And so as they were so important for the disciples of that day, so they are important for the disciples of today. And so in these chapters, uh, the Lord is really going to... Uh, open up his heart and prepare them for what they needed to do after he left. And so some of the most important teaching that Jesus did are in these chapters. And we're going to be spending quite a bit of time there. But, you know, it's, it's kind of like those of you that are parents, if you're leaving town, you're leaving your children at home, you always give them those last minute instructions. And even as you're walking out the door, you're still instructing about what you want them to do while you're gone. And this is what Jesus was doing here in, in John 14 through 17, was giving those last minute instructions. And so as we get into his teaching today, we begin with verse 10. And Jesus uh, starts off by saying, Believe you not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Now, as easy as that is to read, don't, don't miss the real depth of that statement. Because it's, it's Jesus is beginning to unfold to his disciples. Uh, and I hate to use this terminology, but it's one we can relate, relate to. He's revealing to them the secret of his success. In other words, he's sharing with them how he was able to do what he did while he was here on earth. And of course, as we read the Gospels and we have an account of all that he did, uh, he left a lot of people as he spent these three years ministering, he left a lot of people with lockjaw when he would leave a place. In other words... <laughs> And the disciples were the ones that had the worst case of it because they got to see it up close and personal. And so, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of that going on while he was ministering. So this is a real key statement where he says, uh, the words that I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Now, keep that in mind as we read on. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now here's the verse we're zeroing in on today. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me, 
the works that I do shall he do also. What an awesome statement. He's talking to his disciples of that day, but how many of you know he's talking to you and I today? And it qualifies us by saying, he that believes on me. So how many of us in this room, me? So how many of us in this room can raise our hand and say, we believe in Jesus? So we have just determined that what Jesus is saying, he's saying to us, just as if he were standing behind this pulpit this morning, speaking to us, he's saying, the works that I do, shall you do also. And I know some of you are wanting me to get to the second part of that verse. But I always say, well, let's do the first part. Then we'll worry about the second part. But just to show you that I know it's there, I'm going to go ahead and read it. <laughs> verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray the, the Father, and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. So here, once again, we, we start off on this teaching that Jesus is doing for the disciples of that day, preparing them for his departure, but also instructing us because we're, we're here until he returns, and we've been given the same assignment that these disciples were given, and we've been given the same ability that those disciples were given. And so all of this is certainly relevant to us and applies to you and I, as we approach this today. And once again, uh, verse 12 is where we're looking at. And most of us would, would have to admit, and once again, we're not trying to be judgmental or critical of what's going on. I told you we're in a learning environment here, and so we bring up what's happening in other places just to illustrate the need for us to be changed. And so we'll say some things within the classroom that we wouldn't say if we were out just speaking to the general public. But you're in a learning environment, and we need to address these things. And with that in mind, I think we all have to admit uh, that the church as a whole is not doing the works of Jesus, let alone the greater works. Amen? Amen. We're just not seeing it. And so <clears throat> we're going to look at three things in this lesson that will give us a better understanding and enable us uh, to begin to comprehend how we can do the works of Jesus and then move on to the greater works. And once again, I'm not going to spend any time trying to figure out what the greater works are. The greater works will come when we begin to do the works. And so that's our first object is to, uh, our objective is to begin to do the works of Jesus. And so today we're going to look at some things that Jesus taught here that would enable us to do the works that he did. And so he starts off here, and the first one we're going to look at is uh, in verse 12 where he says, He that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works shall he do. And notice this word, because. And here he begins to reveal to us why we're going to be able to do these works. And he says you're going to be able to do them because. And the first because that he gives us here in this verse is because I go to the Father. Now, we're going to have to take some time and develop that. And yet, with you know, just looking at the Scripture, we can develop that. And I'm going to put this terminology in here, so you might want to write this down. But basically, he's saying... Uh, in order to do the works that I'm doing, you're going to have to receive my redemptive work. And this is, this is what he's talking about because he went to the Father after he had completed his redemptive work. He was sent to earth for this purpose. And 
he completed that assignment, and that's the reason that he could say, it is finished. And then when he went to the Father, he sat down at the Father's right hand. His redemptive work had been completed, and now he's saying, you're going to be able to do the works that I do, number one, because I've completed my assignment, I've completed the plan of redemption, and now if you'll receive that redemptive work, then it's going to put you in a position that you're going to be able to do what I did. Now let's look at that redemptive work and begin to understand uh, what all was involved in what Jesus accomplished. Now we know he was here for some 33 and probably a half year, but the first 30 years we don't really see Jesus out doing much ministry. He was in years of preparation. And we often say, you'll hear it many times throughout this school year, that preparation time is never wasted time. And a lot of times we get a little anxious and we, we really think we're ready to go and yet God says, no, there needs to be a time of preparation. And we can see this throughout scripture that here Jesus was on the earth for 30 years, but it was only after he demonstrated an experience for us that we needed to receive uh, when he was baptized in water and then the Holy Spirit descended on him. Then he went out into the wilderness and the Bible says he returned in the power of the Spirit. And basically, that's where his work began. And it's shortly after that that he did his first miracle. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of other books out there that try to you know, show that he was, when he was 10, 11, 12 years old, he was out amazing the kids with healing birds and what have you. But there's no, there's no record of that in Scripture. And so, you know, if you want to play that game, whatever. But we, we just want to zero in on what Scripture teaches. And so the account we have that the first miracle he did was after he had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so this is where we take up. But here, here was God's redemptive plan. Now, because God is just, which means that he's bound by his own words, in the beginning when, when Adam and Eve lost uh, this innocence and, and they, the spirit of God departed from man, well, man caused that, and according to God, then man had to get it back. And so Jesus came to earth as a man. And I'll be building on this throughout the year, but one thing you need to really begin to grasp is how important it is to see and understand why Jesus came the way he came. You know, if, 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 if you're God, he could have sent him down in a rocket ship. I mean, he could have come in full grown, you know, just swooshing in on the wings of angels and made a grand entrance. In other words, God could have done it any way possible, but there was a reason that he did it the way he did it. And, and it's really twofold, and I don't have time to amplify on it, but the, the twofold reason for the way Jesus came into the earth was, number one, so we could really identify with God. And number two, where God could really identify with us. And it's so important that you see this or you're going to miss out on really what God's plan is for each one of us. But just think for a minute, and I'm, I've got to get off of this, but I think it's important that we see this. In the Old Testament, you read of, of God dealing with people. But have you ever seen how the people of the Old Testament really didn't have a good comprehension of God. I mean, there would, there would be times that, that God would want to speak to them and they were so afraid of and they'd send somebody out. Like, Moses, you go talk to him, we'll go hide. And this is because they were, they were spiritually dead, so they didn't have a spiritual understanding of God. And so here, and let me just present this to you. When we begin to talk about God Almighty and we talk about someone who always was and always will be, had no beginning, has no end, can virtually hold the world in the palm of his hand, uh, spoke the whole world into existence that flung the stars into space and, and a being that can call all the stars by name, 
When you think about a being that knows each one of us intimately, knows everything about us, even to the number of hair that's on our head, and of course some of us are making it easier on God. <laughs> but when you begin to think about this being of God, it, is it, it's kind of hard for me to relate to that kind of being. I mean, it's beyond anything that I can basically comprehend. But now when he became a man, and we read four Gospels describing this man, all of a sudden now I can begin to relate to God. And here's the awesome thing of the New Testament. Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, then you have seen God. Now, you and I, when we think about Jesus as God, I can relate to that because I've gotten acquainted with him through the four Gospels, and I see him going about, you know what? He, he was walking, where he, he'd get in a boat, he'd go to sleep, he'd eat, he'd get hungry, he'd get tired. Now, I can relate to all of that. I don't know about the rest of you. But then when we talk about God Almighty, he never slumbers, he never sleeps, he never gets tired, he never gets hungry. I can't relate to that. So God said, in order for people to relate to me, I'm going to have to be like them. So, thus the birth of Jesus. But on the other side of the coin, I mean, if you know, God, as we just said, has never experienced hunger, never experienced being tired, probably never had pain, and just go right down the list. So how can he relate to us? I mean, I know he's all-knowing, so don't, don't anybody come and correct me after class. But I'm saying God hasn't experienced what humans have experienced until he became a human. Now, Jesus has come to earth as a man, and guess what? He got in the earth the same way all of us got here, through birth. I'm saying that with some amount of confidence. I'm trying to check to see if anybody might have been hatched. <laughs> but by faith, I'm believing you were all born. And so Jesus immediately began to experience life the same way we begin to experience life. That's after a nine-month pregnancy in our mother's womb. So from the day he came into the world, he began to identify with everything that we experience. But we can identify with God now because God has experienced what we're experienced. And so you follow the life of Jesus and you see he got hungry. I can relate to that. He got tired. I can relate to that. He'd need a nap every once in a while. I can relate to that. And this is the reason the scripture teaches we have a high priest that's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, he's saying, whatever you've gone through, I've had that experience, and I can relate to you, you can relate to me. And that's so important, and, and we'll develop that more. But you need to see how important it is to, to know about the life of Jesus as a man, to see how important it is, and part of the reason that God came in that form so we could identify with him and he could identify with us. So important. And so now Jesus has come to earth the same way we got here. And guess what? He didn't automatically become grown. He lived each day the way we lived each day. And from the time we were born until where we are now, we've had life experiences as we've gone along. And the Bible is very clear about Jesus, how he increased in wisdom in other words, he's taken in uh, knowledge of things that are happening around about, and in stature, which meant he was physically growing, and in favor. In other words, understanding the grace of God and his relationship to man. He didn't just come in and know, know all of that, and we need to understand that. It's important. And so he came to earth, and he knew. And don't you know, because Mary and Joseph had had this information from God that the child they had was a special child here for a special assignment. Don't you know they spent time teaching this child about his call and purpose in life? Wouldn't it have been amazing? I wonder where we would have been if our parents had had that kind of revelation of what God was going to do with our lives, 
how far down the road we would have been. So anyhow, this is, this is what we're seeing in the life of Jesus. And so we see that from the beginning, it was being taught him that he had a mission, he had a purpose, he had a destiny. And once again, every one of us in here, uh, we're here for a purpose. We're here, we've got an assignment, we've got a destiny. And hopefully these years in Bible school will help you to fine tune and zero in on really what your purpose and destiny is. Now, we're not going to give it to you. We, we hope we help you discover it. And so here Jesus comes to earth and, and we find out that he came to earth as a man. Lived a sinless life. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. So he lived a sinless life. And then he's telling them that, that what's about to happen to him, he's about to take up on himself all of the sins of the world. He's about to take up on him all the sicknesses, the curse. He's about to taste death for all of us. He's about to descend into hell for us. And as we continue to follow his life, we see that he's going to suffer for us. But then, because we're blessed to be on the other side of it, uh, we're, we're going to see that he's going to throw back all the demons of hell. And you know, I, I may not get through with this lesson, but I just feel prompted. I got to go right, stop right here and think about this a minute. Up until the time of Jesus, from Adam till Jesus. Every person that came into this world was born with a sin nature, mean absence of God's spirit inside of them. They were all spiritually dead, absent of God's spirit in them. So every person that had lived from Adam until Jesus, Satan had a legal claim on them because of the sin that was in them. Now remember, under the old covenant, all the blood sacrifices couldn't remove sin. It could only cover sin. So everyone that, that died went into a place that Jesus describes in the Gospels as a place of, of departed souls. Sometimes the Gospels calls it hell, but correct deal is a, a place of departed souls. And Jesus gave us insight into that place and said there, there's two compartments. One is called torment. The other one is called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And he taught us in, in the teaching about the rich man and Lazarus, about what took place when the rich man died and went into torment and Lazarus died and went into Abraham's bosom or into paradise. And there was a great chasm, it says, that separated them. But all of them were in this place of departed souls because at that time Satan had a legal claim to everybody because they all had sin in them. But those who had exercised faith toward God went into the place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. Those who had rejected God up into that place went into the place of torment. Well, when Jesus died, guess what? Satan says, here's another one I'm taking down here and holding captive. <laughs> I love to tell this story. <laughs> so when Jesus died, and remember, he said to the thief on the cross, this day will you be with me in paradise, which means I'm not going to heaven. I'm going into this place of departed souls. But when he got down there, here's all these little hairy demons beginning to run up and nip at his heels and, and, and try to, to, and he just shook them off because you know what? Uh, he wasn't like the rest of them that had been there. And so when he got down to that place, he didn't waste any time. He didn't get an appointment uh, with the devil. He just pushed past the secretary, threw open Satan's off his doors, walked right in where the man was sitting, behind his desk in his big leather chair, smoking his big cigar with his feet propped up, thinking everything was under control because he had the Son of God just right where he wanted him. But he'd overplayed his hand because now he had brought one without sin. To that place. He had overstepped his bounds. And Jesus knew that, and so he just reached across the desk, grabbed Satan by the nap of the neck. 
You say, where's this in Scripture? This is the paraphrase edition <laughs> of the account. You can check it all out in Scripture. You'll find it all there. It may not be as I describe it. But he reached across the desk, grabbed him by the nap of the neck, drug him over the desk, threw him on the floor, put his heel on his head, gave it a good twist. <laughs> those, of, those of us from Texas know that when you kill a red ant, you can't just step on it. You got to put your heel on it and give it a good twist. <laughs> and this is scriptural because it says, you know, that he'd bruise his heel, but he'd bruise his head. It's all scriptural. And then he will, but he'd bruise his head. It's all scriptural. And then he reached down and took from him the keys to death, hell, and the grave, just took them right off his belt. Then he marched into paradise and began to unlock all those little places where all these saints had been held captive for all these. And then he said, guys, we're out of here. Let's go. And then the Bible says that they all came out with him. You can read it in Scripture. And it says they were all resurrected. And some went down and walked the streets of Jerusalem. And then... Jesus said, let's go, guys. We're out of here. We're going to heaven. So the Bible teaches, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. This is, this is the scripture that says he led captivity captive. And when they saw that great cloud going up, it was him and all the Old Testament saints going into heaven. Now, bless God, none of us have to have that experience because we've been redeemed by the blood. Now, our, our sin is not just covered. It's been removed. So Satan has no legal claim on any of us. Amen. But this is what Jesus was saying. And then he led captivity captive. He came forth from the tomb victoriously and ascended to the Father's right hand and sat down completing his assignment of redemption. Now he's telling us because of that, you and I, as we put our faith, trust, and confidence in Jesus as going in our stead, he became our substitute, he became our savior, and we accept that. Then he says, now you've been made one of these new creatures that's been created in the very image and likeness of God. Now your spirit and his spirit have become one spirit now you're just as righteous as anyone could ever be. Now, the reason that's important is because when we go out to do the works of Jesus, guess what? We go like Jesus went, knowing that we are righteous in the sight of God. There's nothing be helped against us. And he says, guess what? You got the same spirit that I got. And you're going to be able to do the same works I do. But if you don't have a revelation of how total and complete your redemption is, the enemy will always perch up on your shoulder and begin to say, who do you think you are to do something like this? But if you've developed that confidence in his redemptive plan and you've partaken of that redemption, you just can shake him off the same way Jesus did and said, look, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, I tell you, when that went off in my spirit, I was still pastoring that Baptist church, and I remember the Sunday morning I got up and declared, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, and they all went, <laughs> <laughs> And then they excused me because I didn't have any seminary training, so they just went along with my ignorance. But it became real to me, and that gives me a confidence that right now, God sees me as one of his chosen ones created in righteousness and true holiness. And so with that revelation now, we begin to see that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, what Jesus did, we can do, but he added there's more to it. And he says here, uh, the second thing that he reveals to us here, because I go to the Father, but the second thing he says in verse 13 Whatsoever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it. So now, not only did, did he give us the right to receive his redemptive work, but now he's given us the right to use his name. And, and let me tell you, folks, this goes beyond this religious thing that we've gotten into by just ending everything in Jesus' name. Hello? Hello? These are not magic words.
And yet so much in the body of Christ, we pray a prayer and, and we just can't end it without saying, in Jesus' name. Or we pray for somebody and we always say, I lay hands on you in Jesus' name. Well, if you know what you're doing, that's good. But it's more than just saying the words in Jesus' name. You have to understand that what that means, the words in Jesus' name. You have to understand that what that means is you're operate is you're operating in his authority. By his power, and he has given us that right to do it. When I got married, my wife's name was Linda Eubank. We got married and it became Linda Parr. Believe it or not, I was given her a right to use my name. So we got a joint checking account. And she is never hesitant, struggles, has a difficult time <laughs> using it. She knows the right she has to use my name. And this is what Jesus is trying to communicate to his followers that we have the right because of what he did. We're coming not in our own name or our own authority or anything that we've accomplished, but we're coming to everything that he's done. And this is what he's saying when, when he gave the Great Commission. He says, all authority in heaven and in earth have been given to me. Now you go in that authority. You realize you can, you can do the works of Jesus in his name without saying in his name. The important part is knowing the authority that's in that name and your right to use that name or use that authority. And what did he say we could do in that name? <laughs> yeah, you can look at Mark 16 and he tells you, you got the authority in my name to cast out devils. He says, you've got the authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. He tells us that by that authority, you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, all because of what he did and the authority that he's given us to go do it likewise. And he, he just carries on there. And the scripture says, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it in his name to the glory of the Father. In other words, by the authority that he's given us. He says, just, just do it in my authority. So now he's identifying, number one, you can do the works he did if you receive his redemptive work because he's already made it possible for you to be in right standing with God and, and have God's ability in you. And then he says, and then go in the authority using my name. You know, over in the book of Acts, we have the account of the seven sons of Sceva. They ran up to these demons and they said, uh, we adjure you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> now don't miss this. And the demons responded and said, uh, Paul we know, <laughs> and Jesus we know, but who are you? And then they proceeded to beat the living daylights out of those guys, and they became the first streakers in history. So what I'm saying is you've got to have that relationship and that revelation of the authority you have in Jesus. And you can't just go around saying in Jesus name, saying the words, you teach a minor bird to say in the name of Jesus. So don't get hung up on saying the words, but understand the authority behind that name and the right and the privilege you have to use that name or that authority to do what God asks you to do. John Osteen, one of the greatest ministers I think ever lived, told the story of, of uh, in a dream, he was uh, walking through a place and all of a sudden this fog and mist 
uh, began to come around him, and all of a sudden he saw these demons coming toward him, and, and they were terrible looking things, and, and he, was, he was beginning to have fear, and he was backing up, and, and all of a sudden Jesus was there behind him, and he thought, now I'm safe, Jesus is here. And he said, but Jesus didn't come around in front of him to go between him and the demons. He said he just felt Jesus step in front of him and begin to back into him. And he saw the arms of Jesus going in his arms and the body of Jesus going in his body and his legs into his legs and his feet and his feet. And Jesus says, now you rebuke the demons. You realize that's what's happened to us? Jesus by the spirit has come to abide in us. He lives in us. He resides in us. He's always in us and he's always ready for action. But we've got to begin to meditate on those things of who we are and the authority that we have because of what Jesus did. And then look at the next thing he says here. You can do the works I did because, number one, you just received my redemptive work. Number two, use the, uh, you, you have the right to use my name. And then here in verse 16 and 17, and I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you. Everybody say it out loud. Forever is the word I'm looking for. You just failed your first test. <laughs> he will abide with you. Forever. Shout it out. Forever. That means forever. And ever and ever and ever. And now verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows it, but you know him for he dwells with you. Now remember, this is before Pentecost. And he's saying, he's with you now, but the day is coming. And hallelujah, how I many you know it came? Amen. And now we're on the other side of Pentecost, and we can just say, I'm sending you another comforter. I'm sending you the spirit of truth. And when he comes, he shall be in you. So here's the third thing that Jesus teaches that enables us to do the work that he did, is that he has given us the Holy Spirit uh, to dwell in us. Now, Jesus said it time and time again. Remember, I made note of this in verse 10, but it's all the way through Scripture where Jesus continues to say, the Son of His own self can do nothing. It's the Father in me that does the work. Now, how many of you know it was the Father by the Spirit? Amen. It's the Spirit of God that was in Jesus, and Jesus, everything he did, he was always given testimony. The Son of his own self can do nothing. He can only do what he sees the Father do. He can only say what he hears the Father saying. Here, verse 10, he says, you know, uh, the Father that dwells in me, he does the work. What's Jesus doing? He's teaching us how he accomplished on earth what what he accomplished, and he's saying, now the works that I do, you can do it, and you have the same ability to do it because you've got the same Holy Spirit in you that was in me. And everything he did, he's testifying. It was the Spirit in him doing it, and now he says, you can do it too because you've got the same Spirit. You've got the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus. And, and Jesus just continued to tell them over and over and over. That's the key that we must grasp. It's not ourselves that can do the work, but it's the Spirit of God in us. Now look at this. Here's, here's a real key. I'm going to have to hurry this up. But one of the keys to understanding what he's saying is, I'm going to send you the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. But you know him. And you can receive. I want to zero in on that word receive for just a minute. When I was born again uh, in uh, Sunday morning in Danville, Virginia, and that's a long story. I was for, living in Texas. It's just the way it happened for me to meet Jesus. But on that Sunday morning, when I, when I met Jesus, you know what? I received Jesus. I received Jesus. This is what what I was needing, this is what I was expecting, and so this is what I did by faith. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. 
you know what? I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit did a work in me that, that only the Holy Spirit could do. Once I received Jesus, he had permission to do a work in me. And I want you to know that, that if you're born again, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. But most of you, when you were born again, you said, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and you didn't mention anything about the Holy Spirit because most of us were ignorant concerning the Holy Spirit. But as we go through Scripture, and we don't have time to read them all, but in Acts chapter 1, in John chapter 7, in Acts chapter 10, the question was always about receiving the Holy Spirit. Now let me give you a real earthly illustration real quick. If you, Let's say you were very well off and, and you had lots of money and you had a big house and you, you had a butler and the doorbell rings so the butler goes and opens the door answers it invites the guest in seats him in the living room and then comes to you and tell you, you you've got a guest in the house now you know what you've got a guest in the house But as of this point in time, you haven't gone out to receive him. Are you listening to me? The word receives means that like when you walk into that room, you acknowledge that person being there, you accept his company, you take his hand, you welcome him. That's when you've received him. So many Christians receive Jesus. In other words, they acknowledged him being there. They received him. They welcomed him. But how many of us at that time knew about the Holy Spirit and would say, Holy Spirit, I accept you too. I receive you. I acknowledge you. I, I understand you're there. Basically, that's what happens when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's this acknowledgement of his presence being in you and recognizing him and honoring him as being there in your life. You've received the Holy Spirit. And that's when the Holy Spirit then has the liberty that you give him to begin to do in you and enable you to do whatever God asks you to do. A lot of people, the Holy Spirit's in their lives through the new birth. That's where he lives, but far, far too many have never received him. So Jesus said to do the work that he did, you need to receive his redemptive work, receive the right to use his name, and receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said, the things that I do, the works that I do, you shall do also because, and gave us the because. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? So now all you Holy Ghost filled, God indwelt, God enabled people, be about your Father's business. Amen.